Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us on today's On Aging Conversation. My name is Aman Fazel, and I am the Emergency Response and Partnerships Coordinator at United Way British Columbia. I'm subbing in for my colleague, Barbara McMillan, Provincial Community Engagement Coordinator for United Way British Columbia Healthy Aging Team. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional ancestral territories of all First Nations in this land we now call Canada, on which we gratefully work and gather. The On Aging Conversations series is a collaboration between Healthy Aging Corps and Help Age Canada. If you've missed earlier episodes, you'll find them on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and on Healthy Aging Corps Canada, the national knowledge hub connecting agencies that support and advance independent living for older Canadians. You'll also find the lineup of On Aging speakers on Core, along with other interesting and valuable resources. These are also delivered to your inbox if you've signed up for the twice monthly Core e newsletter. In our work with Core, Help Age, and the extraordinary network of community based senior serving agencies, volunteers, and professionals, we are privileged to encounter many thought leaders and innovators in the field of healthy aging. So, On Aging Conversations was launched to help bring some of these ideas, innovations, and perspectives to a wider audience. And that's it 30 minutes of healthy aging information and inspiration every two weeks. I'll now turn it over to Gregor Sneddon, CEO of Help Age Canada, your host for On Aging. Thanks, Amon, and welcome, everyone. Help Age Canada supports community-based initiatives through its partnerships across Canada and abroad to improve the lives of older persons and their communities. And just thrilled today to be welcoming with us Dr. Paula Roshan, who is a geriatrician and health services researcher. Her research focuses on understanding the unique needs of older adults, most of whom are women. And much of her clinical work as a geriatrician in conjunction with her extensive research has laid the foundation of her expertise on older adults. In July 2015, she was appointed as the inaugural Retired Teachers of Ontario Chair in Geriatric Medicine at the University of Toronto. Dr. Roshan is the lead of Women's Exchange, which is a women's health knowledge translation and exchange center based at Women's College Hospital, as well as the Women's Age Lab. Welcome, Dr. Roshan. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here today. There's so many things we can dive into, and I just thought we could start out with telling us a little bit about, you know, how did you come to have such a passion around the field of aging? How did you arrive here? Well, you know, I was somebody that knew from a very early age that I always wanted to be a doctor. So that part was very clear to me. But I, I don't think it was until well into my medical training, after I was sort of well into internal medicine, for example, that I started to think more about the opportunities around aging, geriatric medicine, and potentially research in that area. And I think part of it, just like we all have personal experiences, comes from things that happened in my own family. My grandparents lived long and healthy lives. And I started understanding that, you know, maybe that wasn't the way it was for everyone. And we needed to learn more about how to improve uh, lives for people as, as we age. And my, uh, my grandfather actually lived to almost 103, just wow. a few days beyond be, before that. So that sort of inspired me to think about aging and what we could do to improve the lives of older people. As my time went on uh, and I started working in this field, I became increasingly aware of the needs of women as age. And uh, that kind of got me going. On that note, tell us a little bit about the Women's Exchange and the Women's Age Lab. Just, I want to let everyone know they're great websites, very well put together with lots of resources at www.womensresearch.ca and then forward slash women's age lab. Check it out. But anyway, tell us, tell us about it. Well, I'll tell you about Women's Age Lab. Uh, that's a piece we're really, really excited about. Yeah. We started it in 2021, so uh, we're, we're fairly new, but you know, if you can imagine, we are, to the best of our knowledge, nobody's corrected us so far, the first research center of its kind to focus on older women, which is, you know, quite amazing. Amazing when you think, as we're all aware here, there's an increasing number of people who are older in Canada and around the world. You know, in Canada, we're about to be hitting that super aged mark where 20% of our population are over the age of 65. And the majority of those people will be women and women have needs 
needs that are different from those of men, especially with aging, yet it hasn't been something that other people have done. So we've been really excited to launch Women's Age Lab and to work really at how do we improve the lives of older women. What are some of the ways that women and men age differently? What are some of the particular challenges for women in particular, and maybe from an intersectionality perspective and the life course, what are some of the differentiating marks? Well, when we were thinking about starting Women's Age Lab, we sort of thought that you're going from looking at aging in general to to focusing on women, and that should maybe be enough of a focus. But the more we got into it, there's so many ways that you could take this and so many potential differences that we had to narrow our focus. So we have four priority areas that we're focusing on for Women's Age Lab right now, and they each sort of identify some of these important differences. So one of them is the idea idea of reimagining aging in place and long-term care. This is important because the vast majority of older people live in their homes. Some older people are in places like long-term care, and the majority of long-term care residents, more than 60%, sometimes more than 70%, in some places I've worked, it's been approaching 80%, are actually women. So this is an important place to look at in terms of what are their particular needs in that you know kind of an environment. A second area that we looked at was the idea of how do you optimize drug treatments for older women? And this is important because it gets into the idea that you know women are more likely than men to have chronic conditions and particularly multiple chronic conditions where they may in fact require drug therapies. Yet we haven't always included women in the research studies, for example, that were used to inform the way these drugs might have been manufactured. And as a result of that, there's often a gap in information about maybe how best to prescribe these drugs for older women in a way that you want to maximize benefit and minimize problems related to adverse drug events. So that's an area that we've also focused on in our So, so our do you work. mean that do you mean that there the, the, the data is not disaggregated by gender for the research on the actual drugs themselves? It's just by age? So it's that, but I think it's a bit more of a bigger issue. We went back and looked at, for example, in the United States, for federally funded studies on drug treatments coming out of the United States, it wasn't until the 1990s that these studies were required to even include women in the studies. And it wasn't until just a couple of years ago that they were required to include men. So you talk about the intersection between those two things, you're really not getting good representation in these studies of older women. And so, you know, even the research evidence that's being used to support the development of, for example, drugs doesn't always consider the needs of older women. So there's that component of it, which is really important. But the part that you mentioned, I think, in my view, is almost a bigger gap in that, you know, when we do have data and we have information about older adults and we have information about women, you'll either see information presented as if, you know, for all older adults, not sort of doesn't seem to matter if they're 65 or 95, or if they're women or men. And we know there's big differences in people who are over the age of 95, those are over the age of 65, and between women and men in both of those groups. So huge missed opportunity to learn about information that would help us more tailor our potential therapies. We've also been looking at uh, two other areas through Women's Age Lab. One is the idea of promoting social connectedness and reducing loneliness. You know, one of these issues that's become so important to us, I think all of us during COVID, when we've had to experience what it's like to potentially, you know, be more uh, isolated and less connected. But we think this is very important for women because women are more likely to live alone. They often outlive, for example, a spouse. And about 40% of those people living alone say that that they are lonely and loneliness also impacts health in a negative way. It's like smoking. It's not a good thing. (laughs) So, um, That's an important area. And the last one, and as you can start to see, you know, even though we've narrowed things down, it's still huge. We're looking at the issue of how do we tackle gendered ageism? We've heard about ageism. I've heard about a lot of that, especially in the news lately and again through COVID. 
But we haven't heard as much about gendered ageism, which looks at issues around discrimination based on not only your age, but also by your sex. And women are likely to experience both forms of discrimination. Hmm. So these are a little bit of a snippet of what we're doing at Women's Age Lab and how we've tried to narrow down our focus into four areas. But you can see that these are still huge and all of them are really focusing on uh, some of the differences between women and men. Well, well, that'll keep you busy. <laughs> I want to change gears a little bit here. We're just right around Earth Day. And there's a lot of topics, obviously, on the climate crisis. The sixth assessment report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, suggests that there's, there's a high probability of global temperature increase surpassing 1.5 degrees Celsius till 2040. And this report provides this detailed account of how the world is suffering the effects of these increasing greenhouse gas emissions, and uh, including food insecurity, loss of livelihoods, the breakdowns of communities. But it doesn't ever really address the needs of older people. And it's you can't help but notice, as, as the population, as we know, is growing so quickly, as you already noted, that even by 2050, there's going to be around 1.8 billion people over 65 on the planet. It with very particular needs and they that it's just not being addressed and as you mentioned regarding drug company research there there just still is no disaggregated data internationally on on older people and how we're able to address this massive demographic shift as we look forward as we plan to respond to crisis and in particular climate crisis and you recently published i think it was last september an article in the toronto star how climate change is impacting older women you begin by noting the rising occurrence of heat waves and the, the growing demographic of older people. And you say older adults, particularly women, are disproportionately affected by extreme weather events and food insecurity caused by climate change. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so I think this is sort of an excellent example of why it's always important to think about older adults and especially women in any area that you're looking at. And climate change is such a huge issue for all of us now, as it well should be. And likewise, you know, aging is another big area that we all need to focus on because of these, you know, big changes in our demographics and the way our population is going to look in the time ahead. So it's sort of like we need to look at the intersection of these two things. It's really, really important. Yet, I think what we were pointing out in the article we wrote uh, a while ago is that often people don't think about this. You know, they don't think about how climate change specifically impacts older people and women, but it, it does have an impact in ways that we need to think about. So, for example, if you think about one of the issues that's, a, that's important for uh, older people and especially women relates to income. Older women today were less likely to have been in the workforce. And, you know, when they were in the workforce, they didn't necessarily have jobs that paid as well as their male colleagues. They took time off for child rearing. And at the end of the day, you know, when you think about some of the, the women who were in positions that had, for example, pensions associated with it, we know that eventually when they retired, their pensions are less than their male counterparts, about 26% less. And so what does that have to do with things like climate change, uh, but it, it impacts it in so many different ways. So for example, if you have less income and, you know, with climate change, you know, we know that, for example, food is becoming much more expensive. We're experiencing that right now. You know, how do you afford the food that you might need to maintain your health and well-being as best as you can? And, you know, that's going to, that's already a challenge and that becomes increasing challenge with climate change. So there's an example. Another that we might think about as relate to climate change is there's concern about, for example, pollution. And, you know, we know that with age, chronic conditions become more common and women tend to have multiple chronic conditions. But that can impact things like respiratory issues may become a problem for older people. And with climate change, there may be more pollution. And so this may become a, an issue if, if people have lung disease and they become more affected. Or women, for example, are more likely than men, for example, to have arthritis. And that may impact mobility if issues arise where they need to be able to move because of issues that are coming forward. So these are things we don't necessarily think about, but they're really important and things that we do need to start thinking about. I have some aging uh, friends in rural British Columbia 
and I think it was there two summers ago or three summers ago when the fires were really bad in the Okanagan area and the whole community was just, you couldn't see, you know, it was just smoke everywhere and smog and they ran out of air conditioners. You couldn't get an air conditioner delivered, no Walmart, no Canadian Tire. And even if they could get one and one particular friend, a, a single woman, she, she wouldn't have had the, the capacity to be able to lift it, put it in the window and, and install it. And there really was wasn't any support or services for her to, it ended up being just local community connections that they worked together to get through it, but there wasn't any systematized way to uh, support. And, and of course she wouldn't have been the, the, the only, the only person. I know, you know, crisis response and design is critical. United Way BC has done a great job in developing theirs now, but I think those are, those are also like prime examples of why we need to be considering older people and climate change. Now, I know you're working with naturally occurring retirement communities or NORCs as we call them. Maybe tell us a little bit about that. How should we be thinking about housing and community when we work towards aging in place, as you said, being inclusive of all people and particularly in this varied geography of Canada? Well, I think the story that you just told about you know, how doing something like getting an air conditioner when, when you have extreme heat can be difficult, especially for older people and especially for a woman is just such an important uh, kind of example. I remember years ago being in a heat wave when I, when we had a young child and we had to go out and get an air conditioner and, and it was, it was tough. I remember years ago when, when we had a young child and we were in a heat wave and we had to go out and get an air conditioner and it was it was tough uh, to do first off to find and then to get it back and to get it installed and all those sorts of things. So I think you can imagine how it would be very difficult for an older person who may not be able to get to the store easily and certainly would have trouble installing something like that that can be so very heavy and, and difficult. These are real, real problems that people are experiencing. And I think you can imagine that if you're a, a woman and you're more likely to be living alone, that this would be an even yeah. greater challenge. So when we think about NORCs, like NORCs means naturally occurring retirement communities, and basically they're defined as buildings, and it's often like apartment buildings where 30% or more of the residents are older people. And often these older people will be women, but they provide a huge opportunity to help people age in place and age well. So for example, example, when you're in a NORC environment, it's possible that there could be somebody in that apartment that could help with some of the very basic things that you might need help with that might be difficult to get. So that would be an example. I need an air conditioner. You know, how can you help me put it in or making sure that people have access to that sort of thing already. But there may be other things that are sort of more, more simple that could be helpful there, you know, like people just need light bulbs changed and it means climbing. And if you had somebody that could be there to help you, it makes a lot of difference. But th the things that's so good about these sorts of environments potentially is that there's an opportunity for social connection. So right. often people are on their own in an apartment or a condo. They don't necessarily know their neighbors, but through some of the enhancements you can bring to these NORCs, you can promote social connections. So if you were in a situation where there was a heat wave, People can be checking on each other. You can do things to help each other. You're not necessarily isolated, which is such a, a potential problem for older people, especially women. So these NORCs provide an opportunity to bring in supports when they're needed and to create opportunities for social connections, as well as supporting things that are more specific to health. They're very important because there's more people that are living in these NORC type environments than there are in retirement homes and long-term care homes combined. So this is a really interesting way of thinking about how you can promote and allow people to stay in their homes for longer if that's where they want to be, and at the same time promote their health and well-being. I mean, so often we're, we're told that people don't want to go necessarily to long-term care. They want to stay in their homes. But in order to do that and to do it well and safely, they often need additional supports. can be very helpful for things like some of these climate change type issues that we're dealing with. But just generally, they can help improve quality of life for people. It just makes me also wonder, uh, Paul, if you may, if you know, if there's an older person in the community that would be interested in learning more about how to uh, learn more about NORCs or look for one in their community or near them. Are you aware of any, you know, resource or how somebody might start exploring that as a, as an option for themselves or maybe for a loved one? 
you can look at our website. We have some information about NORCs there. But there's yeah. also probably things that are in people's local communities as well. And sometimes it's word of mouth. Like some of the buildings that are NORCs are buildings that actually promote it that way. Like they'll talk about in our building, you know, they have different programs that are there to promote engagement or different kinds of resources that they bring in. So sometimes that's also just known about and talked about because it's a very big asset for many people to have this kind of a, an environment, a rich environment for them to live in, to help, you know, with these social connections and health related pieces. Yeah. And I think even just Googling naturally occurring retirement communities, there's a wealth of, of information and uh, all over the country available for those who, who are more interested to explore a little more along with uh, your website. We're just about coming to the, the end of our time, but I, I have one more thing I'd really love to hear you comment on. And, and that's something that as we're working with ageism and even checking in on our own ageism or ageist attitudes, which I think we all, uh, when we really look closely and are honest, we can find them in ourselves. I think, I'm not sure how they arrived at the statistic, but the UN notes that one in two people hold ageist views. I wonder if it's even higher than that. But one of the things that we, we really try to pay attention to when we speak about aging in the life course is, and we fall prey to this for us at Health Age as kind of fundraisers and trying to raise attention and around some of the plight of older people. But how do we balance that with not always speaking about older people as victims, you know, as the ones needing of help, but but rather to change that language as as older people are, you know, are empowered citizens, they're, they're human rights holders, like all of us that we walk with for whom we you know, we try to make space for their voice to be full participants in society and, and the decisions that affect them, nothing for us without us, uh, as the saying goes. I wonder with such a lens of how can we support older women in our own communities, both from a community-based senior services perspective, but also just from a personal perspective and my own aging female family members and friends and neighbors. Well, I think you've outlined the issue very clearly. We often think of older people and think that they have disadvantage, but I think we forget that, you know, about, you know, 93% of older people are living in their homes, they're living well, and they're huge, you know, contributors to society. And so we do need to think about that and we need to think about what are the ways and what are the things that we can do to continue to promote healthy aging for older people it's thinking about things like how do we promote you know ongoing engagement one of the big pieces that we are huge opportunity is the opportunity for intergenerational connections that benefit both the older people but also benefit the younger people there's opportunities for example older people will often have homes and they have space and what they what they need is perhaps uh, some assistance with some things but they also need companionship and at the same time you have students who are in need of places to live. And they don't have a lot of uh, resources from a financial perspective, as an example. And the two can potentially live together and share homes and it, things become sort of mutually beneficial. And older people are huge contributors from a volunteer perspective to so many of our organizations mm -hmm. benefit younger people and older people alike, but they have a huge wealth of expertise to bring to the table. So I think we, while we often focus on things that are on the negative side, there's so much good work going on and being led by older people that's inspirational and it's opportunities to bring older people and younger people together that we really need to think about this, especially since we are a society where there we will have such a large number of older people who have so much to contribute and we need to make sure that we're taking full advantage of that. Excellent. Dr. Roshan, it's just been been such a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you so much for making the time to uh, to share with us on on our On Aging podcast. It's just been been great to hear so many of your ideas and the amazing work that you that you are doing. It's, it's extremely inspiring. Thank you for being with us. Oh, thank you so much for the invitation. And to all of our listeners, thank you so much for joining us again here on on aging, and we'll look forward to being with you again in a couple of weeks. Take care, everyone.